We're going to talk today about blackjack, and we're going to talk about the S&P 500. How do you get superior returns in a consistent and logical way? The two games, and I call them games, are you need to be systematic, you need to be disciplined, and you need to be religious about your strategy. This is my first trading experience. I really don't differentiate between uh, trading and investing, and when I played blackjack, I was an investor. Uh, I, played for, I played for five years uh, consistently. And I used the strategy that was developed by Ed Thorpe. So we're going to talk about these two games and what you need to be is a consistent uh, and disciplined in your strategy in both of them. Um, Ed Thorpe uh, developed a strategy in an ar academic article in 1958. That was a hard, hard copy book in 1962 and then a paperback in uh, 66. And the first thing they did is they tried to figure out what the basic strategy is. That's what you do when the dealer, given the dealer's up card and dealing in your card, you have three, four choices, hit, stand, split, or double. So they figured out the maximum expectation for each of those. So the first thing you have to do is memorize this chart, which is very easy to do. And the second thing they did, they said, well, what if I take some of those cards out of the deck? Let's say I take all the fives out of the deck. Well, in this case, we'd have a 3.29% advantage. And that means you'd make, for every $100 you bet, you'd make $3.29. Now, if you took all of the aces out of the deck, then you'd be losing $2.72. The simplest strategy was to count two through six as plus one, tens and aces as minus one, and the rest of the cards were neutral. For five years, I played from 71 to 75, I played blackjack. I had a real job too, but every chance I had, I was in Nevada. And that advantage up there is my lifetime average. I made 80 cents for every $100 I bet. I didn't win every time. In fact, if I went up for a weekend, my chances of being a winner were only two out of three. And obviously with the S&P 500, we have, it's a very uncertain game. So both of these are uncertain games, but it's the discipline and the systematic approach that allows you to be a winner in both games in the long run. This is my second trading experience. I took the money that I had in blackjack and I went to the options floor. First on the Pacific Stock Exchange and then the CBOE. But I was continually fascinated by the market. And I read all the, all the indicators and I, I said, there's, there's got to be a way to somehow predict this of what's going to happen, to get some kind of an edge in my investments um, in the long term. Um, so in 1981, I did some research on whether you could actually predict the S&P 500. And these were my findings. Uh, this, is, this, is the, this is where I gave this paper and I tried to compare Blackjack, options trading, and the S&P 500. And these were my conclusion. There's significant potential to time the market, but the games of blackjack and options create a better risk return. And so as a result, for the next 18 years, I sort of put timing the market on the shelf and uh, concentrated specifically on options. And this is the result. We were actually trading in nine countries, 26 different exchanges, and there was this little firm in, in New York that said, hey, there, this may, there may be a different way of trading here uh, that uses automation and does things in a systematic and a disciplined way, and maybe we ought to look at them. That little firm was Goldman Sachs. But I was continuing to be fascinated with the marketplace. And I read a book. Uh, by Rick Anderson, Market Timing Models. And when I'm interested in a topic and I've read a book, I usually call the author. You think, well, am I bothering that author? No, he's usually excited to hear from you because somebody read his book. And th this gentleman, uh, I actually hired. 
And we had a number of strategies that were successful on the shorter term basis, but I continue to be intrigued about the longer term horizons. And I don't know about your portfolio in 2008. I had really pretty much a passive portfolio, but my portfolio didn't do too well in 2008. So I continued, I continued to look at the academic world and must have read 100 papers on the equity risk premium. That's the return on the S&P 500 minus T-bills. Um, and I determined, well, there, were, there are a number of variables that have some information, but it's a small amount of information. Let me show you the kinds of information we had. There's a gentleman by the name of Robert Schiller who got the Nobel Prize, and he came up with something called uh, CAPE, Cyclically Adjusted Price to Earnings Ratio. And this is um, what the returns look like on a six month, what the six month returns look like relative to CAPE. As you can see, there isn't a lot of information, but there is some information there. Let's take a look at the next, uh, the next 12 years. There's some information, but it's only slight. Can we combine this variable with the other, I'd say, 15 to 18 variables that are in the academic literature to see if we can do a walk-forward simulation? Is it possible to time the market? And so what we did, that's what we did. We did a walk-forward simulation of these with no for look-forward bias. And these were the results. This had a strategy, you'd go somewhere between 150% long and 50% short. You bet in proportion to your advantage, as you do in blackjack. You count the indicators just as you count the, count the cards in blackjack. Now, the returns look pretty good. We got a 14.75% return with this strategy versus a buy and hold of 5.52. And the sharp ratio, which we look at more closely than we do the returns, um, was superior. Now this looks pretty good, doesn't it? But remember, there's only a little bit of information in these markets. And so, it actually, if you look, if you look back at this other slide, you'll see that for years, the number of years it doesn't outperform. It does just as well as the market, or maybe even a little, not quite as well as the market. It actually only outperforms seven out of the 14 years, and the sharp ratio is, but the sharp ratio is better at 10 of the, of the 14 years. I'll just show you just the three, three variables here. So we have CAPE right now. This is uh, price to earnings ratio is high relative to where it's been. That says we're just looking at that variable. It's a 1.28% contribution to the long-term value. Uh, the long-term, this is a, a prediction over the next year. It's really saying that we should have a 10% return in the next next year. So it's it's almost, it's about, uh, I think it's 90% long at this time. Um, the Baltic Dry Index is an indicator that uh, has been consistent. It's the cost of shipping around the world, and it has been declining lately, so that's a negative contribution. But we're actually in an uptrend, and that's what that's moving average, so it's, it's, a, it's a technical, a proprietary technical indicator. But you can see we have, in this case, there are 11 indicators of which some come in and some come out of the model. But that's similar to what we looked at in blackjack. We had 10 indicators there. We've got about 10 indicators in the S&P 500. Now, can anybody build this model? Well, first of all, you've got to have a good data source. And you have to use not the data in the Fed website, but you've got to go back and see what it was like as it was reported, not as revised. So it's a little tricky of not having any forward bias in this data. The second thing, you gotta have two PhDs, and you gotta work for about two years. So it's got about four, I have about four man years into this, uh, into this project. Now how much do you invest in this? Do you put all your eggs on the, uh, in one basket? No, obviously not. I have 10% of my wealth in this, in this strategy at this time. Um, will this work in the future? With this small amount of information that is so inconsistent? Be honest, I don't know. Ask me in five years. But I think this is the only systematic way that I come to a strategy that I felt comfortable with and I felt. So I feel a little more secure as we go into any kind of a downturn that I'll pick that downturn. There's one more issue about tactical asset allocation. 
Everybody uses tactical asset allocation. In fact, it's well documented that people tend to increase their holdings of stocks near tops, and they tend to sell stocks near bottoms. This not only is suboptimal, but it creates instability in the market. And I believe that if people did use a systematic approach toward tactical asset allocation, that we would actually have more stability in our markets. Let me leave you with this one thought. I believe that as in the last 30 years, as tactical asset allocation was considered a bad word, and it was considered irresponsible to use market timing or tactical asset allocation, I believe in the next 30 years, if you don't use tactical asset allocation, you'll be considered irresponsible. Thank you. Thank you.